much for joining us. This is Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. I'm a clinical psychologist, leadership consultant, and a really big fan of you getting to fulfill your life purpose. I want you to get unstuck and unlock your potential relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and vocationally. Thanks for joining us and let's get started. Welcome to Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. It is my passion for you to live in the fullness, in abundance, in passion, and getting to streamline each area of your life so that you can uh, thrive in your calling and stay in your lane. And recently, our family, unfortunately, has gone through a significant loss and transition as my mom was promoted to heaven. And in the whirlwind of all of that, I reached out to a good friend of mine, shout out Joe P. Peterson. And he said, I want to connect you with a great friend of mine, Eric Donovan, who is a quarterback for families. Um, and I was intrigued. I don't know what that means um, because we don't play sports. Um, and it's just been this really cool friendship of learning from Eric, his passion and his lane of helping families transition well with finances and uh, stay in a heart of unity and making sure they're protecting their families. Um, in our own family, when my grandpa passed away, um, it caused a huge divide. And many of you out there probably have gone through things, or you have friends who have, that uh, the passing of somebody could actually bring more wounding in the aftermath if we're not prepared well. You're already grieving the existing loss, uh, but then the bitter and the fighting and uh, lawsuits and different things that could fall out are really painful. And when I was I think like eight, I lost cousins. I lost half of my family um, because of money, because of misunderstandings and um, not having good conversation and not preparing well. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to my new friend, Eric, and he's going to chat with us about why it's important to prepare financially to protect your family and protect unity and peace. Well, that's quite an introduction. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And that's a that's a loaded question um, <laughs> because that's a lot that's a lot of stuff to cover. Yes. Uh, here's the short answer that I would start with, and then we can see where this goes. Yeah. So, my experience, my life experience, yeah. tells me that money is not the cause of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what happens is money has the capacity to reveal and magnify the problems and issues yeah. that we've been ignoring. Yes. So true. So the place that we see this magnified the most is in a lack of money mm. or in an abundance of money. Yeah. So my own story starts back in West Texas. I was raised in Lubbock, Texas. My dad was a veterinarian. My mom stayed at home and I had kind of this idyllic childhood. Uh -huh. I mean, my just walk to school, everything was great. My seventh grade year, my mom fell and broke her arm mm. and through multiple surgeries, ended up getting a staph infection. We buried my mother the day before I started my freshman year of high school. Oh my gosh. And that then, I have a sister who's seven years younger than I am. That then set off a series of events for my father having to wake up every single morning he was running a business, but did not have good life insurance. He didn't have good health insurance. He yeah. just was kind of doing the business thing. Yeah. And bills were coming in and he has to wake up and decide every morning whether or not he's going to be Mary Poppins or he's going oh. to go to work and run his business. And so emotionally and relationally, that was a really, really hard time for our relationship. Sure. His health really declined. The financial stress just caught up to him. Mm -hmm. Two months before I graduated high school, he fell bankruptcy. Oh my gosh. And so that lack of money then put on me, it, it, you see all the strain on the relationship and everything like that. That right. lack of money put a strain on me. And then I went on a pursuit thinking that if, well, if I just became wealthy, then that would solve all the problems. How many out there have thought that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. So I just need to get wealthy because uh -huh. that'll fix everything. Um, that pursuit made me completely miserable um, through a course of some different actions and Bible study. If anyone's familiar with crown ministries, you're not. No. Okay. So it's basically a biblical study of what God's word says about money. Oh, awesome. And there are two lessons in the beginning. Um, the first lesson is that you don't own anything. Mm -hmm. God owns everything, mm -hmm. which was a little bit of a 
Like what? I don't know anything. <laughs> and then the second one was, if you can't be content where you are, then God has no business giving you any more than what you have right now. Mm. And so those two lessons really kind of disrupted me and disrupted my life, put me on a path towards working in the financial services industry with a passion towards helping families kind of avoid what I had gone through, mm -hmm. right? And what I had experienced. I was on the way to get an MBA in finance from Arizona State. I was living in Arizona at the time. And the dean called me into his office and said, tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you're passionate about. So I started explaining it to him. And he said, you do not need an MBA. You need a job. <laughs> you need to go work in the financial services industry. He said, my number one concern is that you're going to spend all this time getting an MBA. And then when you graduate, you'll go get the same job you could get today without mm -hmm. an MBA. Mm -hmm. So I went to work in the financial services industry, working um, for a big name that everyone would know. Mm -hmm. um, and because I started getting in my lane and my calling, God really just blessed me. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. I was, it was obvious I was right where I was made to be and yeah. created to be yeah. and um, was getting promoted faster than most people inside mm -hmm. of that. I was getting promoted into positions that most people had five or six years experience or longer. Wow. And so I was seeing that happen. And my wife and I were, she was pregnant with my um, son Clayton, and we were trying to get back to Texas because we're in Arizona, away mm -hmm. from family. Mm -hmm. And there was an opportunity to take a promotion within this organization and actually be face to face, elbow to elbow, knee to knee with families and helping them begin to have these conversations. Yeah. Um, and the gentleman hiring for that was hiring manager over Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Wow. And he called me up one day and he goes, I don't think I, I don't know that I'll ever have a place for you in Texas, but we mm. made the wrong decision in our play in our new Orleans office. So if you would go to new Orleans and take over this, you can have wow. this job. So this was a dream job at this point. This was, yeah. um, and way beyond, again, just God's favor was on me because most people in this position have been in the business 15 or 20 years and I'd been in like three. So wow. yeah, I mean, it was a total, God's favor thing. And so I got that job and we moved to the New Orleans area. And this is where the ship that, so you go to lack of money. Now this is where the abundance of money side of this comes sure. in. So Hurricane Katrina happens. I feel called to go out on my own and start my own business, but I don't know what God's doing yet. Mm. I just know that I'm supposed to go do something else. And I had a family come into my office and their comment was, my grandfather started an oil and gas business. Mm. We are we own a portion of that now that he's passed away. We get a pretty big check every single quarter coming in and we don't know what we're supposed to do with it. Someone mm. suggested we come see you. Mm. So we sat down and I started kind of understanding where they were coming from. They had young children and had an incredible heart for generosity. Mm. And I was like, well, this is, sounds like a lot of fun. We could do some really cool things. I'm imagining we would help them do creative giving and we could help them do their things for their family. And there yeah. was a lot of fun things that could get created, but I was still young in the business and didn't know what I didn't know. So I went and I found, I asked around and around and I found the very best estate planning attorney, mm -hmm. very best CPA, very mm -hmm. best everybody. We put as many people on the team as we could that would be good on coming up with the plan. And when we got finished, what I say, which is true is I was sick to my stomach because the only thing I felt was that's it. This is all you guys can come up with. There was no creative giving strategies. Mm. There wasn't anything It didn't feel creative. It yeah. felt, um, and it just, there was something that was off on it. I didn't know what was off. And so what I'm going to do real quick is fast forward, finish the story on what was off and then back up because two months later, I had a huge transition in my life that led me to where I am today. So Fast forward seven years, this family's company went initial public offering on the stock market mm. and the family's wealth grew by 10 to 15 times what it was before, which left still children, multi, multi-millionaires wow. beyond what they wow. should, the parents ever wanted them to inherit or wow. should know about at that age. Yeah. Um, it started to lead to lack of motivation, mm -hmm. to um, just some discontentment. Yeah. Um, we had one of the neat the other family members that didn't work with us, but work with other people who had did similar type planning. One of the nieces ended up dying of a drug overdose. Oh gosh. And what ended, what it ended up being, um, what I discovered, the more I've been in this business, it was a really, really good estate plan mm. it was a really, really good tax plan. It was a really, really poorly thought out family plan. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
that is what transpired. And here's the thing. People are like, well, how does that story go? Well, that story is still going because you can't, you can't, un- once something explodes like that, you can't undo it. Yeah. It's really, really hard to undo that type of growth. Mm. Um, so we're doing the best we can to kind of work through it today. Mm. But the parents still today are like, that's not what we wanted to have happen. Wow. Um, so, and there's still ramifications that we're dealing with. Two, three months after that happened, I met a gentleman who for 30 years had been working with families of abundance, especially Christian families of abundance, who were in front of transitions or opportunities and just helping them think about how do I steward what I've been giving and what is God calling me to do? And he was asking questions the way that we phrase it today at the intersection of what I call family and finance. Mm-hmm. So when you go sit down, what I've discovered to be true is when you go sit down with most financial professionals, there's not a whole lot of creativity. And I hate to burst anyone's bubble who thinks that they've got the best attorney or whatever. Here's what I know in my experience of years of working with hundreds of people is we have five templates that mm-hmm. almost every family will fit in. Okay. Um, there's no creativity. <laughs> There's not. So you're going to fall in a template. You're going to fall into a template. You're going to pay thousands of dollars for a template. or You're going to pay a couple hundred dollars for a template, but you're going to end up in a template more than likely. Um, And if there are attorneys listening who feel that that's different, I'm sorry, but it's the experience I've had. Most people are selling you a strategy, a tactic, or a tool. Mm. And on the surface, it may look really good. Again, it may be a really, really good tax strategy. It may be a really good estate tool. It may be a really good, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever. But what no one is taking the time to do is take a step back and say, okay, what are the long-term unintended consequences? What's going to happen in five years, 10 years, one generation, two generations, three generations. Yeah. And what we discovered, what my mentor had discovered was if you take the time to take a step back and say, this is not a financial question. This is a family question. So how do we ask the right family questions up front Yeah, with a unique process? And the, the thing that's interesting is people are like, well, tell me what the question is. Well, no, the question isn't the question. The question is usually two or three questions deep off of one question. So yeah. you answer one question, another question comes up, yeah. you know, and you end up two or three questions deep and you find the real answer. Yeah. And so it's having people who have the time to ask the right questions from there when you can ask the right questions, mm-hmm. then you can go find the right strategies, tactics, and tools that will create the best outcomes. And so when you've got an abundance of money, if you're not doing this and you're just following the traditional system of what's out there, just mm-hmm. the, the term that I've come up with uh, that I really like is most people are getting really, really good return on investment. Mm-hmm. Like what's your return on investment? Oh, you've got a great return on investment. What we ask people to measure is what's your return on intention? Huh? So it's still ROI. Yeah. <laughs> but what is it, what you're intending to have happen? Is yeah. that really going to be the outcome of what comes out of this? And mm. um, I've worked with billionaire families and all the way down to, you know, just a few millions or whatever. But our overall overarching experience over and over and over again is people who are getting great return on investment are not getting great return on intention long term because they've not been asked the right questions to connect all that together. And so I'm, I'm going to land this plane quickly and let you ask questions rather than hijacking your microphone. No, I think it's whole, great. <laughs> for the whole time. That's great. But the experience that we've had is most people are working with someone who's giving them a plan for what happens when they die, mm-hmm. not a plan for what happens while they live. Mm, that's a good point. And then most people are ending up <coughs> me. with unintended consequences because of that. Mm-hmm. And so what we try and help people do is let's think about what we want to have happen while we're living. Mm -hmm. How do we engage? Because we can engage the family. We can have conversations while we're living instead of leaving. Like you said, you lost some family members after someone passed away. Well, because when somebody passes away, now the communication element's gone. Yeah. So how can we enhance communication up front? How can we bring communication up together at the moment while everybody's still alive and everyone still has an opinion one of the words and phrases we use is we try and give so mom and dad are the stewards of what they've been given Mm -hmm. that but how do you give the family a voice even if they don't get a vote so at least they feel heard yeah that's good you may not you as mom and dad you may not change your mind about what you're going to do yeah but you can say, here's what my plans are. Now they get a voice about that. They get to understand why, what your intentions were in doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we can think about creating a plan for life, the other thing that it unlocked that got us really excited 
was we found out that most people were paying substantially more income taxes than they needed to. Mm -hmm. And then the other- Who can resonate? (laughs) The other thing that came true was most families have the capacity to increase their generosity three to 10 times what they're doing right now without changing anything about their lifestyle or anything that they want to do. No one's asking them the right questions. The entire industry is set up to- cause you to build bigger barns Mm. without any thought to why you're building bigger barns. Yeah, (laughs) it's a good point. Okay. Well, if you don't need to build the bigger barn, why couldn't you give more away if you could still do everything that you want to do? Yeah. But no one asks that question because the the incentive to the financial industry is for you to build a bigger barn because they make more money, the bigger your barn is. Percentage. Sure. Absolutely. So that let's say we just flew away. I mean, like we went over all of it, but I mean, that's, yeah. that's the, so now we gotta that's go my passion. Yeah. You got to get in the weeds. Mm-hmm. Okay. So some of you, this may be like exactly your lane and you're like, I need to talk to this guy. Um, this is not a commercial for him. I think he's fantastic, but it is for you to start thinking through whether you have money and you're in the place of prosperity and abundance, or if you're in the place of humble beginnings or bankruptcy or rebuilding. Um, I've had some guests that are in divorce situations. Mm-hmm. And so now they're in a second season or, um, a, you know, a bankruptcy and you're having to rebuild or pivot, or a lot of people went through COVID. And so you're kind of to reimagine what Mm. your new normal looks like. And so I'm hoping that instead of this being something that feels far away and esoteric for lots of like, you know, wealthy people, but that every one of us are being intentional to think through and pray through, how can I be a wise steward so that I'm leaving a blessing and a legacy behind me and not just accruing more for myself and then have no exit strategy of Mm. what to do after that. And I think that's really sad. I know um, my precious grandpa that I look up to, I think incredible things about him. Um, Apparently he was like a millionaire in the bank, but lived his whole life like this poverty mindset. Um, And he was accusing people of stealing money, but Mm -hmm. really the lack of oxygen to his heart, uh, they found checks in his, his wallet, you know, like undeposited checks because his brain was starting to maybe not get as much, much oxygen. And so each of us have a story and money is usually a part of it. Mm -hmm. And the love of money is the root, the love of money is the root of evil. But how can we be stewards instead of holding all that money and hoarding it? Because if you've come from which my family did the grapes of wrath, the dust bowl in Oklahoma, farmers that were displaced and had to start over in California. Um, And then if you still have that mindset of like a poverty mindset, then if that doesn't get healed and the Lord never gets to minister or bring freedom there, many of us even could in the bank be prospering, but emotionally Mm. really be struggling. And it can be very divisive and can separate families and cause a lot of strain. Um, So what would you say for somebody who maybe they have some money, maybe they're not the bajillionaire, uh, but they have some money, but they still live with that chronic fear of lack and don't know how to get out of that? Well, I think that that's a, that's an important question because I think we all struggle with that. I, I think Jesus said it best in Matthew six. I mean, it all talks about no fear, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that my favorite statement, and it actually is the mission statement of Paradigm is seek first, because it says seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And so I think it really is, do we trust him at his word? Yeah. You know, because yeah. at the end of the day, I had someone paraphrase that for me. And it's my favorite paraphrase is what God is saying to you is if you will take care of my kingdom, I will take care of yours. It's mm, good. And so that really is, you know, this entire message of God has not given us a spirit of fear. Yeah. Right. So the minute that you start getting that, start check that. I mean, that's not from God. Mm-hmm. So what am I wrestling with? What am I dealing with? But what have I experienced in the past? Um you know, one of the things as you were saying that, that I realized that we didn't talk about, and maybe we could here. Um, so we've developed, so whether you've got abundance or don't have abundance, I think these six principles resonate. We've developed six principles of what we call transformation. 
Um, because this is about the intersection of family and finance. And whether you have a little or you have an abundance, you have to think about the fam the emphasis on the family yeah. as much as the emphasis on the finance. Unfortunately, the way that the world talks to us is so, we know you got to do all these financial things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we like to say to people is a whole lot more will be done in your living room than will ever be done in a professional's conference room. Say it again. Say it again. That's so good. much more will be done in your living room than will be done in your professional's conference room. Mm -hmm. And most people think, well, I've got to go see the attorney or I've got to do this. What right. if you started with in your living room mm -hmm. with the right conversation? So there's six principles of transformation that I think it can apply to anyone. Okay. So principle number one is your top asset is your family. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to hey, make a list, what am I worth? What do I have? If you don't list your family as the number one thing you have, then you've missed the point of why God has brought us all together. I mean, yeah. God has brought us together from a relational standpoint. Absolutely. What we all miss, you know, and one of the things when it comes down to generosity and everything, I've seen people kind of get a little bit uptight and like, oh my goodness, you know, generosity. I don't know. Church just wants my money or whatever. It's like, you know, God's got all the money he needs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. God does not need your money. Absolutely. What he wants is your heart. Yes. So God wants your heart, mm -hmm. not your money. It just so happens that God so loved the world that he gave mm -hmm. his only son. So the reason that God likes generosity is that he's a giver. Mm -hmm. So we are never more connected to him than when we're engaged in generosity because that's who he is. So we're connected to our creator yeah. when we do that. It's good. And so that generosity element is just a factor of who our creator is. Yeah. And so it's not about the money. So what did God give to us? Well, he gave us our families. That's good. So our top asset are the people that are around us. And whether we have an abundance or we lose everything, those people are going to still be with us. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, right? right? If we don't like sabotage things. Right. But if we love them the way that God designed for them to be loved, they're, they're the constant yes. through the ups and the downs yep. financially. Mm -hmm. Principle number two is your top as your top investment is your business. Now, for those people who don't own a, the, the couple of things that I would say that we part of our business, we do investing. It's a conversation that comes up a lot. But one of the things I always tell people is invest in what you know, because mm -hmm. God has designed people differently, mm -hmm. especially I, the majority of wealth that I've ever seen created was created inside of a business. Mm -hmm. So somebody who owns a business or is creating a business or is building a business has no mon business giving money to me, pour it into your business yeah. where you can really make money. But the yeah. other side of this is a spiritual element, whether you have a business or you simply go to work, which is that is where the ministry field is ripe. Mm -hmm. So people don't have to go to church, but they do have to go to work. Mm -hmm. So your opportunity, whether you're a business owner, to be a, be the only place that people see Christ, either through your business and through your employment, or yeah. if you are employed and in an environment, you may be the only church yes. that so those good. people see. Yes. So your top, the top thing you need to be pouring into is your where God sends you into your mission field yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. And how many of us spend time in discontentment mm. where we wish I had the million dollars. I wish I had the yacht. I wish I had the other business or I was in the indi other industry. And yet the Lord's assigned you where you are. So I feel like just reiterate, some of you are discontent. And if you would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, which includes uh, repenting of mammon, which is just the love of money. Um, it's happened to me. It's happened to lots of us that we just have to reposture our hearts. And it's really subtle. All you have to say is, Lord, I repent for loving money and looking to money as my source, mm -hmm. my God, my provision, instead of looking to you as my source and then trusting that you'll meet all of my needs. And you can trust that he's a really good provider. Yeah, he is. He is. I, actually, my life shift, the, the day things shifted was the day that I was, when, when I was going through that lesson. And it was, if you cannot be content where you are, then you'll never, God, why does God have any business giving you anything else? So good. And it was that moment that I went, okay, if this is all I ever have, if mm -hmm. this is all it'll ever be, then I'm going to be content right where I am. Yeah. And that's where things shifted for yeah. me, was that ability to just sit inside of that contentment. That's so good. That's yeah. so good. Yeah. So having the right order, not loving money yeah. more than God right. or our family, seeing our family as our first top asset, top asset, and then our business as our investment, top investment, or whatever your industry is where he's assigned you. And it's a ripe mission field. 
Um, yeah. And then what's our third principle? So the third principle is your control of money is finite. So how many people, especially as wealth accumulates, you will meet a lot of attorneys and professionals will be like, hey, build this dynasty trust or create this thing that'll go on for multiple generations. And if you look at the statistics, I don't know if you know this or not, but 90% of wealth typically disappears in three generations. Yes. And the demise of families. Correct. Oh, but gosh. Just the financial yes. aspect of this. So I'm about to, so I don't have... This is, I'm, I do not have a theology degree. I just like to study God's word. I have found something that I believe that resonates this. I've not found anybody else confirm it yet, but this is what I believe to be true. So if you look at that 90%, there's a scripture where King Solomon makes the statement that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a good man mm -hmm. and his children's children. Yes. Three generations. Yeah. Okay. So where does wealth typically fail? <laughs> After, that After three generations. Yeah. <laughs> so I started looking more into this and kind of asking the question and putting other scriptures together. It's like, what if this is just a spiritual principle? And what it's based on is God is a God of relationship, because mm. more than likely, who will you only have a relationship with during your life? You will more than likely only have a relationship with your children's children. Yeah. So if you're going to leave an inheritance, you don't leave, you do, you can leave financial inheritance, but it's more about the wisdom that you leave. It's more about the insight. It's more about the living room time yes. that you leave. Yeah. And so rather than trying to create these plans where I'm going to have my money go on for generations to people who don't even know you, who you don't know if they carry your values, mm -hmm. you don't know what's going to happen. And you're trying to rule beyond your grave yeah. where you don't have any influence, focus your energy on this. You know what? My control of money is finite. I have to be ready to pass the baton. Yeah. I will not be the one here for the yeah. fourth generation. What does that mean? It means you've got to do a really good job with mm -hmm. your, your kids. Yes. Because they're the ones who's going to make sure or who can pass the baton to the fourth generation. Yes. You'll, you'll never have the ability to do that. Yeah. So it then increases the responsibility of mm -hmm. being good at passing the baton, yeah. which leads then to principle four, which is, transformation happens in relationship. So good. Right. Psychoanalysis, we would say the same. <laughs> <laughs> True transformation is not a financial transaction. Yeah. Yeah. It's about time. It's yeah. about investment. It's about mm -hmm. making yourself available to the people that are most important to yeah. you. You know, so we run through those three and we've hit, we've kind of hit around money and other things like that. But then we get into the final two principles um, get to be a little bit more kind of on the spiritual side, but the generosity defeats scarcity. Mm, I think a lot of people need five. to hear that. Yeah. So generosity defeats scarcity. If you find yourself in a place of scarcity, I would encourage you to be more generous. Yeah. And so in freedom ministry, that's called operating out of the opposite spirit mm. that you shut down the enemy by doing the opposite of what that sin nature, that flesh nature wants to do. Yeah. So in, um, Malachi, um, there's a verse where God says, mm -hmm. this talking about giving and mm -hmm. generosity yes. and a tithe. Uh -huh. And he said, I think it's Malachi 310. He says, test me yeah. in this mm -hmm. and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven that yeah. you will not experience so much abundance. So let's be careful. This is not a genie rub the lamp. God's right. going to bless everything that we do, but yeah. I've never known anyone who has been poor by being generous. Mm -hmm. I have thousands of stories of people who've experienced an incredible blessing through generosity. Yeah. And even if you're skeptical, what I love about this is it's the only place in scripture God uh -huh. says to test him. Yep. And if the test doesn't work, you can stop. Yes. <laughs> Yes. My, 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 I've even challenged atheists on this. I love this because I'm like, well, I mean, if God's not it's real, then if, if God's not real, then it won't work and you can just stop. And then you get a chance to talk to him more about God because exactly. it works. It always works. It always works. It always works. Absolutely. And so what's interesting though, when you look at this principle, I think there's really two great lessons for us in history. One is Rockefeller was asked the question, they asked John D. Rockefeller, who was a strong Baptist, by mm -hmm. the way. I mean, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, but they asked him, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough? And his comment was just a little bit more, Ooh. right? Uh -huh. Versus there's a gentleman named R.G. Letourneau. Mm. Um, if you've ever heard of Letourneau University, which oh, yeah. is out in um, East Texas, um, R.G. Letourneau, 
owned a earth moving equipment. He basically owned Caterpillar before it was, it didn't become Caterpillar, but he had a company like Caterpillar okay. before Caterpillar existed. He was very, very popular in World War II with his earth moving equipment and everything like that. R.G. Letourneau gave 90% of his wealth away. Wow. And he kept getting wealthier every year. Wow. And they interviewed him one time and they said, R.G., what is going on? He goes, I don't know. I shovel it out. God shovels it back in and God's got a bigger shovel. <laughs> It's so good. Right. So I want to pause here because I hear a lot of people complain and they say, oh, the pastor just wants my money. They talk about tithing, blah, blah, blah. The, he and I are business people. We yeah. don't benefit from anybody tithing. There's nobody who's writing me a tithe check. Nope. Nobody's writing him a tithe check. We're just saying, hey, my family literally living in trailers. My dad literally, they lived in the garage while he was remodeling and they had little scorpions going through my <laughs> brother's shoes, like poor as church mice, as my mother would say. And in one generation, my parents have done really well, but my mom always credits it to, credits it to tithing, to being generous, mm. to sewing into other people, buying them houses, cars, beds, different things to bless somebody. And often without them even knowing it was coming from her, mm. they would give through the church or through Salvation Army or another community organization. So the person never knew, but God's economy, he knows. And he says, if you don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, you're putting good seed mm -hmm. into your bank account. And then he gets to richly reward and bless you. Yeah. So again, people who don't benefit, we are not a church. We're not pastors. We don't want your money, but we're saying, Hey, if this is going to bless you and it's going to bless your family, and then you can be more enriched to love others well, and not be stressed and anxious about money, please take this seriously. That was like the biggest life mission life message of my mom is to just tell everybody about the joy mm -hmm. of generosity because it changed their life a hundred percent. Well, I will add on to that. So let's say that you're one of those people who's really frustrated at the church on giving. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make some pastors uncomfortable here. Stop, mm -hmm. stop giving to the church. Sure. So our greatest experience where I fell in love with generosity was um, my wife was pregnant with my oldest son, Clayton. We were $200 short on paper every single month. And we felt like God wanted her to stay home. Wow. And we were like, how are we going to do this? Yeah. I don't know. That's what God wants us to do. Yeah. So we went to the test me in this, um, but we didn't have a church home. So we took our first fruits offering every month. First, just the first 10% of everything that we had, because we didn't have a church home. And we would pray for God to send us the right donation requests in the mail. And so in the mail, we'd get requests from Habitat for Humanity or uh -huh. from a local women's shelter, or, yeah. you know, something yeah. like that. And we would lay hands and pray over those and let God guide us on where to give. We fell in love with giving. So don't start with your church. Go somewhere where you can just, you because God wants you to experience the joy of generosity. Again, God doesn't need your money. Right. At some point, I think if you're in a church, you need to be tithing to the church. But mm -hmm. we're talking about breaking the spirit or breaking the heart of this uh -huh. to get you to really, truly understand generosity. But the yeah. cool part is that year, which started out $200 short on paper every month, we paid off $7,000 in debt that year. Right? God's economy is so right. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's so cool. Yeah. $7,000 in debt. Wow. How? I've had people like, well, how did you do that? I'm not going to go back and measure that. I'm not going to go find out. If yeah. You look, I mean, David got in trouble for counting. I'm not going to go back and count yeah, exactly. how that happened. But I know that every single experience since then, I've had multiple crazy generosity experiences where God has shown up and worked little crazy things like providing to the penny, but it started with a general movement of generosity. Yeah. yeah. It's so good. Right. I'm going to share a quick story. So this is a really sweet one. My parents own apartments and there's hail damage in Texas. So there's tons of hail, tons of damage. And they're like, oh, dang it. So they're filing with the insurance company and the insurance is like, we're not going to pay. And then they're dragging their feet. And so nothing is moving. It's just all stalemated. And my mom gets a check in the mail. And that's what made me think of it. Uh, or not a check. She got a, uh, a request in the mail. And I think it was Katrina. I'm mm. not sure 
sure, but there was some kind of a horrible tsunami that hit, maybe it wasn't Katrina because it was in another country. And so Compassion International had kids in that country and their, um, their homes were all destroyed. And now there was a bunch of like the gnats and the bad things that could hurt the kids and they can get malaria. And so they were asking, would you donate toward rebuilding the building and then giving cots and then the nets over it so the kids don't get malaria? And so um, she is in heaven. So I can now say the specific number. So she gave uh, $10,000 to Compassion International so that they could do that. And it was like hundreds of precious children who now had somewhere to sleep and were safe and weren't going to get malaria as they slept. So now all of a sudden, I mean, this had been months with the insurance company in their own life. Now, all of a sudden, the insurance guy calls them up, super frustrated, huffing and puffing. And he's like, well, I just feel like I'm supposed to give you $100,000 for your, uh, your fixing of your roof and the hail damage and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, <laughs> right? What? We had been so long and stalemated and could not get breakthrough. And so the Lord gave hmm, $10,000 turned into $100,000. Oh, wow. That's the economy of God. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So with so, oh. generosity defeats scarcity, I'm going to land the last yes, one, which is here. today echoes through eternity. Ooh. So everything that we do, what we fail to realize, we, we're always so caught up in our own lifestyles and our own life, right? But what we fail to realize is that our life in comparison to eternity is but a blip. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not even that small versus how long eternity is going to last. Yeah. So everything that we do, you know, we feel like when you're a little kid, you feel like, you know, 30 is old, you know, or whatever. And then as you get older, it's like, that's not so old. And then you start <laughs> to kind of realize your own mortality. But as you go through that, it's like, no, every single thing I do is going to have repercussions in eternity. So I must be very careful steward of what I have, because I have such a short amount of time here, and I'm going to spend forever in eternity. Yeah. So what I'm investing and in how I'm spending my time here is such an important consideration. It's so good. And when you operate from those six principles at the intersection of family and finance, you really start to see a completely different financial story, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. different outcomes, different things happening. And yeah. I, we've got, there's one of the things if people especially are of abundance or are thinking about what they want to do, um, I encourage people to go on our website and look at our case studies. And often the comments I get are, are these case studies real? This just looks, this looks unreal. I don't know how you could ever do this. And my comment as well, I have to tell you, those case studies are not real. They're, they're real people, they're real stories. The numbers on there are not real. They're typically about five to 10 times what I'm showing there because once God gets a hold of it, mm -hmm. that's what we thought we could do going up front. Yeah. And then in most of them, and it, if you look at the numbers, it looks unreal. Like yeah. saved a sub substantial amount of taxes, saved, did all this giving did all this other stuff without changing anything about what they were doing. And then God gets a hold of it and he puts the multiplication. I was like, if you don't believe this thing, you're not going to believe what really happened because yeah. that was God's economy. Yeah, it exactly. worked. And then it becomes the other transformation, the transformation that's happening as family relationships are healed. Mm. The transformation that's happening as families go on mission trips together yeah. or, yeah. you know, getting engaged. And sometimes it's the transformation that happens just in having a hard conversation around the yeah. table that, everyone's been, the elephant in the room that everyone's been ignoring, but we finally get to start talking about it. Yeah, that's right. And just to be really practical. So I work with a lot of CEOs and wealthy people like the Rockefeller story of like just a little bit more. And so they have spent so much of their lives pursuing money that mm. they've lost their soul and they've lost their kids. You can lose mm. your wife. I work with a lot of families where a neglected wife eventually might find love somewhere else. And I'm not promoting that, but I'm just saying reality, what you don't steward properly usually becomes neglected and will find love somewhere else. Um, so if you really care about money, then think of it this way. The time you're spending away at work that you're not spending with your family, you're going to pay for it in the adolescent years when they have to go to the psych hospital and they have to go do family therapy and marriage therapy and all the juvenile hall things. Because trust me, I work with a lot of wealthy, successful people and it's usually their family that pays. Mm. 
because there's this fear of lack, this mammon, this finding your sense of worth, validation in your accomplishments and your status and the bank number. And in that time that you're pursuing wealth, you may be losing your soul and you may be mm -hmm. losing the very precious people that God has entrusted to you. So I hope there's conviction, whether you're male or female. I've seen this on the female side as well, just super driven. And then the family is way neglected and it's really easy for the enemy to start picking people off. And you're looking up going, well, what happened? How did this, I've been around. Yeah, you've been around, you haven't been invested. Mm. And so mm. continuing education you do in every area except your family. Yes. And so if you're not continuing to educate yourself on their hearts, their emotions, taking them on father daughter dates or mother son dates and vice versa, if you're not practically invested in their day to day life, don't expect to get a harvest and a good yield mm. in that area. It's just sowing and reaping. There's just principles in reality, just like gravity. There's just legal principles of how the world works. And if you are expecting your family to just wait for you as you go make this bajillion dollars and this accolades to the world, they're feeling neglected and you have lost the very treasure. So in his point number one, that is your number one asset. If we seek first God's righteousness, his kingdom, his righteousness, and then we're putting our family first, and then you you are investing in your business. We're not saying be lazy and eat bonbons all day. Uh, we're business people. We understand you have to, you got to hustle. Uh, but in that season, if you're putting it in the right order, the Lord can't help but honor his word. It's the only area, like Eric said, that you get to test the Lord and say, hey, God, this is your word. And I have seen it again and again and again. Um, and I've seen it in my family and I've grown up with them being business people and being generous. And so now through modeling, I just picked that up. I have a phenomenal relationship with my parents. Um, and then I've now gotten to walk in a lot of that and see my own testimonies of God's faithfulness. So I hope this encourages you. I pray that uh, there's no shame or condemnation, but just little quick heart checks, like a little quiz on the inside of like, hey, Lord, how am I doing in that area? And I just like to have a heart of repentance all the time of like, hey, Lord, am I under a curse in any area of my life because of a love of money, because I'm striving instead of resting in your provision? Am I looking to money, career, success, titles, achievements as my source, which means I have a God above you? Mm -hmm. If so, it literally says there will be a frustration allowed in that area of your life. Mm. How yucky mm. to gain everything, have all this stuff in the bank and then feel frustration and not feel blessed. And I work with a lot of people that are going, well, I thought it was going to be a lot more fulfilling when I got here. I thought it was going to feel different and I have everything I want. And now I'm more depressed than ever because I have so much money, but no drive or like the generational yeah. that if the children don't have a drive and they know, oh, I'll just get mom and dad's money and they can get expensive drugs and designer this and that, um, then there's not really a motivation. So we want to make sure that we're intentional in training our children in the way they should go so that when they're old, they won't depart from it, that you're giving those principles from a young age by being present, mm -hmm. by having those conversations in the family room. And not expecting some professional out there to have that conversation with your family. Um, money is so much a part of our lives. And may it not rule us, but may we submit to God and be good stewards with open hands. And the illusion of control is a psychology term for the same thing he was talking about. That is really an illusion that you think you can control your money. Mm -hmm. You're a steward of it. And the more generous you are, then God gets to richly bless you in return. Mm -hmm. I love you guys. Thanks for joining us for this episode and we'll put the links for eric and uh what's it well, i've got one other thing oh, for you real, I quick, hear it. real quick so for anybody that's out there yeah we have something we call a family impact kit oh so a family impact kit is a day worth of activities for all various ages adult children down to little kids as awesome. well so um you can do it all in one day you can break it up you do it however you want to but it's a free download all you have to do is send me an email eric at paradium.org p-a-r-a-d-i-e-m cool dot org okay and send me an email and put in the title family impact kit and we'll send you the link to the download and all the instructions and so we make that available for free and that does again that's not i have an abundance i have a little it's for everybody Anybody. yeah, yeah. So that would be something I'd offer just to your audience, anybody Aww. who wants it, it's available. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll have links to everything. I love you guys. And we'll see you for the next episode. Bye. 
Hey friends, thanks for listening. We would love for you to get plugged in with the Unlock You community. So follow the links below and stay up to date with upcoming content, events, and groups. We are here to invest in you and tailor episodes around your interests. Post comments, and hey, if there are any specific topics you'd like to hear about, let us know so we can strategically build content that is meaningful to you. And will you share this podcast so we can invest into more amazing people? Be sure to hit subscribe so we can see you for the next episode.